Scripture reading will be Mark chapter 4, 35 through 41. And the same day when the even had, was come, he saith unto him, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to the other, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Morning. For those of you that are traveling, we appreciate you being here. Glad you chose to stop by. And if you're close, you should stop by all the time. We'd love to have you be with us on a regular basis. We've been preaching through the Gospel of Mark. And so this morning, we find a, a very familiar passage. A passage about Jesus calming the waves. And I think all of us know the story well enough that we could almost just kind of say thank you very much and, and go to lunch. But there's a few things that I noticed this time through that perhaps I hadn't paid attention to before. Let me remind you as we get started about a song that we sing in youth group. Now, uh, when you were a youth, they may not have sung this song, but it's been around about as long as, as I have. I've got confidence the Lord is going to see me through no matter what the case may be. My Lord is going to fix it for me. Anybody familiar? One. All right, Cindy, you want to sing it? No, okay. <laughs> Cindy. Cindy and I are going to take a pass on but this one. That song, I've got confidence. The Lord is going to see me through. No matter what the case may be, my Lord is going to fix it for me. It's easier to sing than it is to live, yes? There are times that we think we've got it all together, and like from day to day, our confidence might be pretty good. But the next morning we get up, and there may be something facing us that's not quite as easily set aside. So I'm going to give you a chance to take a quick uh, pop quiz uh, on a scale of one to five, one being I am not very confident at all, and five being I am so confident that I never have any doubts or worries that the Lord is going to take care of whatever the situation may be. I'm going to count to three, and we're going to throw up a hand. You only need one for this one, five fingers. Uh, either a one up to a five. Are you ready? One, two, three, throw them up. Okay, Becky's a five. Well, I got a lot of fives. I'm at about a three. Okay, Eva and I can hang out. There, there's, a, there's a sense that, in my life at least, that I want to be in charge. I want to deal with things that I'm able to take care of. If I can't fix it, then I worry about it rather than setting it aside or realizing that there's a power at work in my life and in my world that is much, much larger than I am. Sometimes I have a hard time just turning things over to the Lord. And as a preacher, that's a real problem because who owns the kingdom? So since the Lord's supposed to be in charge of the kingdom and I just work for him, why is it that I think I need to fix everything? Same thing for you. We're all in this together. All right, so a couple of things that I noticed. Number one, we need to be confident enough to separate ourselves from the struggle Jesus and his disciples had been on a preaching junket again. Uh, he had most recently preached to a very large group on the seaside. And if you remember, they got into a boat and he went out away from shore a little bit and preached from there, that kind of natural amphitheater effect. And he preached to the group that had gathered and he did some healing and he did some preaching. And then he said to his disciples, we need to get out of here. We need to go somewhere else. So they got in the boat and they started out to go to the other side of the lake. This was something that Jesus did on a fairly regular basis with his disciples. It's time for us to go and just be somewhere else. It seems that part of what Jesus was trying to do was to shuck off some of the, the extras. Right? There's so many people who need so many things. Let's move our base of operations. Let's go somewhere else. And by going somewhere else, maybe some of those people that are following us will go home. 
And you say, well, why in the world would Jesus want to just send people home? Well, if they're true followers, if they were really trying to be Jesus' disciples, their heart uh, would still be with Jesus even if their feet went home and they would find him again later and the gospel was still being preached. It wasn't that every person who clamored after Jesus all the time was somebody that Jesus needed to take the time to fix. Right? There were healings, there were teachings, there were lots of people with lots of questions and lots of needs and occasionally Jesus would just say, we need to go somewhere else. Right. So be confident enough to separate from the struggle. There were no demons in the boat. Right. There were no sick people, no lame people, no deaf people, no blind people. Nobody struggling was in the boat. It was just Jesus and that inner group who were going from one side of the lake to the other to kind of separate themselves from the situation. Now he didn't separate himself from everybody. He just separated himself from all the work, from all the problems, from all the, the clamoring, from all the needy ones who were coming after him. He said, you and me, that is, the disciples and Jesus, need to go over to the other side of the lake. And I don't know whether the disciples got this message, but this was the message that came uh, with my reading this week. I can't decide for others what they're going to do. People will do what people are going to do. But you don't have to put them in the boat. You don't have to take them with you everywhere you go. You can decide who's going to be close to you. You can decide where you can be most effective. You can decide where your energies are best spent. And again, Jesus is not throwing out the kingdom when he throws out all the clamoring people. Jesus is, well, he's neck deep all the time. In kingdom work, that's why he was here. But he knew better than the clamoring crowds what was important to the kingdom at that moment. So he took with him his small group of disciples, got in a boat and left. Sometimes we need to be confident enough to separate ourselves from the struggle, to set sail towards somewhere else. And along with us, we might take that inner circle of people, the ones that we trust, the ones that we're sharing with, the ones that understand our ministry and our life a little bit better perhaps than do the others. But we don't have to put everybody in the boat. Second of all, the disciples needed to learn to be confident enough to rest in their relationship with Jesus. This is the big one. I mean, that's, that's what the whole account is about. Why do the gospel writers even tell us about Jesus doing this? Right, this is Jesus telling the winds and the waves to be still. This isn't Jesus healing ten lepers at once. This isn't Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. This is Jesus in a boat telling the waves to be still so that they'll have a calm journey. But the disciples needed to learn that being with Jesus trumps all the other problems that they might have. So as you're separating yourself, as you're launching out away from the problems, Always remember that the one who is with you is mightier than whatever problem you may be facing. In the disciples' world, the weather wasn't the biggest problem. The biggest problem was their lack of faith. The biggest problem was their lack of willingness to buy into the fact that the guy who could heal ten lepers at once, the guy who could raise the dead, had everything under control. They didn't need to panic but they did. So when a furious squall kind of comes into our lives, we've got those two possibilities. We can relax like the Savior, or we can panic like the disciples. Now, like I say, I'm a three. I'm kind of in the middle. There are days when I'm relaxed. In fact, we, we mentioned it in class this morning. Sometimes things happen in our world, and we look at them, and we weren't really expecting them, but we know where they came from. You know what I'm talking about? And you just have to kind of stop and say a quick prayer. Thank you, Lord. That was neat. All right? I had no anticipation of you doing anything like that. I didn't realize that was on its way. But I see it and I appreciate it. And I want you to know that I glorify you for all the stuff that you do that I'm not expecting. Right? You can raise your hand on that one, right? We all have that experience. It happens to us. We, we don't even know what to pray for like we ought to because we don't have a clue what he can do. We think we do, and then he does something that's so far 
removed from our wildest imaginations, our God is amazing. And when we've ceased to be amazed, we've probably ceased paying attention to God. But we can panic like the disciples, or we can relax like the, the Savior. And I noticed in Mark's gospel something that I haven't noticed in the others. He says that Jesus was asleep on a cushion. Did you ever notice that before? Not just that he was asleep, but he was asleep on a cushion. Here's the mental image I've always had of this episode. Jesus is in the boat. He's been preaching. He's been teaching. He's been healing. He is ex he's just exhausted, right? So he sits down in the back of the boat, and he's in a very uncomfortable place, and it's, you know, wood and rocking, and, it, and he just... He, he can't stay awake anymore. He just kind of passes out from all the, the fatigue of doing his ministry. And then I read what Mark says. Mark doesn't say that Jesus just kind of passed out in the back of the boat. Jesus nested in the back of the boat. Jesus had a cushion. Jesus set himself up for a place to take a nap. He wasn't worried about anything going on around him. He says, I've got this made. So he takes a cushion and he's, you know, I can see him kind of pounding it in and like you do with your pillow at night, you know, get it in just the right shape, get your body in just the right posture. And Jesus is out. He is enjoying the ride from one side of the lake to the other, asleep on a cushion, not a care in the world. Isn't that beautiful? If Jesus is with you in the boat and Jesus is on a cushion asleep, what does that tell you about your world? It's something that God tried to do for the Israelites and that he's trying to do for the church today. When he first brought the Israelites in on the whole idea of Sabbath, he said, I created the world in six days and on the seventh day I rested. I want you to have that. When he brought them up out of Egypt to Canaan, he said, for all those years, for 400 years, you were slaves in Egypt, but now I've brought you up with a mighty hand. I want you to enter into my rest. The Hebrew writer says their problem was they didn't have enough faith to enter into his rest. And then he says, there remains therefore now a rest for the people of God. God's calling us into that rest. And it's not just a we're not doing any work today kind of rest. It's a confident kind of rest that says if I'm in the boat with the Savior, I don't have to worry. I can relax. The same God that keeps the world spinning is the same God that's in the boat with me. And my life may be difficult and things may be weird, but I've got God with me. The disciples didn't get that, but the disciples were new. Right? The kingdom hadn't fully been established yet. So they were excusable. But you and me, I mean, at least in my case, I grew up in the church. Daddy was a minister. I was in church. Well, it's like Ray Lynn. I mean, I was brought to church when I was a baby baby. Uh, I was like Binky, you know. I, I was the kid in church and people were like, you know, that one belongs to the preacher, and they, they just always make, make uh, that the center of focus. They, they love up on your children as they grow up in the church. I had that experience. Right? Daddy was in the church. We were in the church. I've always been in the church. It just seems natural to me. And when I see Jesus in a boat in a storm, my mind immediately goes, eh, he'll take care of it. Right? There's no doubt in my mind, but there was doubt in theirs. I promised some guys on the tennis team that uh, I would mention something that happened to us back about 1978 or 79. Uh, I've told you recently, I'm, I'm back in communication through Facebook with my coach from that era. James he Brinkley. is a, uh, an amazing guy, and he put up with me for four years playing tennis. But he took us to Grand Prairie, Texas, and the Grand Prairie team's name is the Gophers, the Grand Prairie Gophers, and until I came to a place where they're the gold bugs, I thought that was about as odd a name as you could pick. But the Grand Prairie Gophers, we assumed we were going to wipe up the court with them because we were the Stallions and they were the Gophers. So we went and got on the court with uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jeff, um, I've lost his name, anyway, Jeff Bibbs. Jeff and I were on the court together and we were 
done with the match before the match ever started because the two guys who were playing for the Gophers were so confident and so cocky about their game that we got psyched out before the first serve. We were we never in that match in the least. Uh, I think we got beat 6-1 or 6-love or something. I mean, it was a it was a rout. And I can remember the look on Coach Brinkley's face when we came off the court, just kind of shaking his head, you know, and looking down at the ground. That must have been the look that Jesus had when the disciples woke him up. I think that's the look. He's looking around and there's wind and there are waves. And for Jesus, it's a so what moment. And for the disciples, they're terrified. Lord, don't you realize that we're about to perish? We're dying here and you're sleeping in the back of the boat. And Jesus says, where's your faith? Where's your confidence? Why don't you understand yet that I can do whatever needs to be done? But there's one other little nuance that Mark gives us that I've always missed. And that is that there were other boats. Had you ever read that before? Had you ever noticed that in the other accounts? I'm always centered on Jesus' boat, right? The disciples are in the boat. Jesus is in the boat. That's the only boat on the water as far as my mind was concerned. But Mark says, and there were other boats as well. So Jesus gets in the boat. He starts across the water. Some of those folks that he didn't put in the boat owned boats. And so they got in their boats and they're kind of making a regatta. They're going across with Jesus wherever Jesus is going. What did the people in the regatta learn? that that's the boat, that's where you want to be. You want to be in the vicinity of that guy because in the middle of a storm, in the middle of something that should have killed us all, in the middle of something that should have caused a whole lot of archaeology for somebody later on, right? Lots of boats at the bottom of the lake. This guy just kind of gets up off of his nap and says, peace, be still, and everything is calm and quiet like a mirror. You ever drive by that drive by that pond uh, on your way south out of town on a day when it's really, really calm and you can see every tree on the bank mirrored in that thing? I wish I was an artist. It's one of the prettiest places in Alva when it's calm. Sometimes when it ices over, you get kind of that ripple. It's just a beautiful little pond in the middle of Alva, that's what it looked like when Jesus said, be still. That's what our lives should be looking like when Jesus is in the boat with us. We need to learn to separate ourselves from the problems. We need to learn to quit taking all of our problems on ourselves and just carrying them around with us, thinking that somehow we're going to fix it. We need to be willing to let Jesus take care of the things that we can't possibly accomplish ourselves. So you've got the disciples who are amazed. You've got folks in other boats who are amazed, and here's their response. Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now I want you to fill in the blanks for your own life for just a minute. I'll coach you a little bit, but I'll assume that, that you've got things going on that I don't know about, just as I have things going on that you may not know about. But here you go. Who is this that even my illness is under his control? Even my relationship is under his control. Even my fears are under his control. Even my late night loneliness is under his control. Everything is under his control. And his prayer for your life is, let me take care of it. And his words for your world are peace. Be still. Would you pray with me, please?
Father, we thank you for the power that was at work in Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for the demonstrations that you gave of the power that you had and that you have. We're sorry that we forget that it's about you and not about us. We forget how powerful you are and, and how gracious and loving a God we serve. Father, I pray that you would look into the lives of each of us and that you would help us to understand that as long as we are your children, we have nothing to fear. Not the worst things that life can bring, nor the fear of death itself, but only the understanding that whatever happens, now and in the future and forever, that we belong to you. Father, keep us close to you. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen.